we are welcome to this special edition of our clinical meeting. And on behalf of our HOD, pharmacist Arima Falebi, I welcome you all to this meeting. But before we proceed, I'd like us to observe a minute silence for the repose of one of our headers, Solo Opalike, who passed on yesterday. May you so rest in peace. Let us observe a minute silence for him. So, so the topic for, for us today is titled Kaplan Mayer Techniques in the Comparison of Clinical Characteristics and Outcomes of Patients with Severe COVID 19. And to do just to this is an expert. Professor Josiah Alamo. And our moderator for today is Dr. F.E. Williams from the Department of Clinical Pharmacy Practice, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Illinois. I want to call on her to start the meeting. Ambassador Williams, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the chief host, pharmacist R. M. Afolabi, I welcome all of us to this week's clinical meeting entitled Keplamea's Techniques in the Comparison of Clinical Characteristics and Outcomes of Pharmacy of Patients with Severe COVID-19. This is to be handled by an assistant professor, Josiah Alamu. Our expected participants include professors from University of Illinois, UITH, and other universities in Nigeria, fellows of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, fellows of the West African College of Pharmacists, directors of pharmaceutical services within uh, Nigeria. We also have participants from Nova Southeastern University, USA, HODs from University of Illinois and University of Illinois Teaching Hospital, pharmacists in diaspora. We also have physicians, nurses, other health professionals within the University of Illinois and other states, we are all welcome. Before we start this week's clinical meeting, we want to remind ourselves of some housekeeping rules. If we have questions, we want to make use of the Q&A box or by raising our hands. We also want to mute ourselves or remain muted when the presentation is on in order to ensure that there's minimal distraction. In case we are called upon to contribute, we want to ensure that the background noise is kept to a minimum. We want to also avoid multitasking and distractions that can benefit maximally. We take the citation of Associate Professor Alamo, Dr. Abu Larry Ido, of the University of Illinois Teaching Hospital, we do that. Dr. Edu, you have our attention. Thank you very much. Can we hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Dr. Joshua Alamu is an infectious disease epidemiologist. He obtained his PhD from the College of Public Health, University of Iowa, Iowa City and his MPH from John A. Bourne School of Medicine, University of Hawaii at Monao Honolulu. He is currently an Associate Professor of Public Health at the Department of Public Health, Dr. Kiran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Alamu is an experienced educator and an administrator. He has taught several courses in epidemiology, environmental health, biostatistics and global health at the graduate and undergraduate level. Prior to his appointment at Nova Southeastern University, Dr. Lamu served as the chair of public health department at the University of Illinois Springfield. His research interest includes viral hepatitis and co-infection with HIV among vulnerable population water quality assessment and waterborne diseases, environmental risk factors, and its association with infectious disease in low-income countries. Dr. Alamu has coordinated and supervised several study abroad trips to Gambia and Ghana in West Africa, where American students were immersed in cultural and experiential learning activities. 
He's a board member of the Hospital Sisters Mission Outreach, American Public Health Association, and American College of Epidemiology. Please welcome with me, Dr. Josiah Alamu, PhD, MPH, Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, former Chair, Department of Public Health, University of Illinois, Springfield. You are welcome on board, sir. So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I am extremely grateful for your invitation. And I, and I want to thank the organizers, you know, for giving this, you know, a very thoughtful, um, I, I, I think it's innovative that you, you guys utilize the, um, the technology to bring people together. I, I think we should give you a round of applause for that. Um, so today, what I intend to do, before I even go into presentation, I, I can see some names you know, that I really want to recognize, if you don't mind. Um, my, my bigger boss, Bassman. You know, go, ahead. He, go ahead, please, please go ahead. I think Bassman is around, you know, and it's been a long time, sir. You know, thank you so much for, for coming today. You know, folks from Ife, Ilori, all over Nigeria, I really appreciate your coming. So what I want to do now is to go ahead, I will share my slides with you, then we'll go through it. Um, so then I also, if we have time, I want to do a demonstration using a software so you can see. Um, the reason why we are doing this is just to encourage you know, our you know, pharmacists, our professionals over there, that you can also do it. You can use the software, you can crunch the data, and you can you know, make an informed decision based on the data that you have. It's that simple. So it, do I have the permission to share my screen? Please, you have. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. Okay, so sorry, just give me one minute. Yeah, so um, today we are talking about Kaplan-Meier techniques um, in the comparison of clinical characteristics and outcomes of patients uh, with severe, you know, uh, COVID-19. And like I put there, you know, this forum was organized by in the pharmacy department, you know, University of Illinois Teaching Hospital um, in Nigeria. So I would, you know, my presentation is partitioned into three parts. The first part, I want to quickly go over the roles of pharmacists in public health. Then I will, I will review very briefly, you know, the epidemiologic study design to help us understand the Kaplan-Meier. Then the second part, I would you know, talk about the rationale behind Kaplan-Meier techniques. Then the last part, we will talk about a study where the Kaplan-Meier was applied and we will see whether we can you know, demonstrate using uh, a statistical software called R, you know, um, which is free for, for everybody. Okay. So we, the, the, the presentation will be based on this article published by, you know, Yang and his colleagues, where they look at the you know, clinical characteristics and outcomes of patients with severe COVID-19 with diabetes. So that's, that's what our presentation is going to be on today. So now let, let's talk about you know, public health you know, for, for a minute. According to the you know, uh, Institute of Medicine, uh, the, there are 10 essential public health services, okay? And if you look at this, you will see those you know, 10 essential public health services are partitioned into three, assessment, policy development, and assurance, that is, in public health, we monitor the health of the community. That is our job. 
And in public health, we tend to diagnose the problem within the community. We investigate the problem, such as what is going on right now with COVID. We go into the community, we screen people, we, are, we, we come up with data to show that this is the problem, then what can we do about it? Then we inform people, we educate them, and we empower people to take charge of their own health. That's what we do in public health. Now, we know that government cannot do it all alone. So we mobilize the community in a partnership, you know, to come together so that we can join us. Right now, the Red Cross is out there, the frontier, you know, uh, medical doctors are out there. Almost every single person within the community are there um, working together to make sure that this COVID, you know, uh, did not affect uh, almost everybody. Then we develop policies. We develop policies. For example, there are policies in the United States right now. You cannot go to grocery stores without putting on your mask. You can't go to you know restaurant without putting your mask. Those are policies based on our knowledge of the you know uh, the disease. Then we enforce laws. Although um, with the COVID. It's very difficult to enforce you know, the law of putting your mask, but I can tell you in some stores, if you do not put on your mask, you won't enter. You know, um, when you do not put a seatbelt when you are driving, the police can enforce that, they stop you and they give you tickets. Then, you know, our job is also to link people to services. When you see somebody who is sick, you tell them, you refer them to the hospital. If somebody has a mental you know, problem episode, you, you, you send them you know, to a medical doctor, all sorts of things like that. Then we also assure that people who are in public health profession are competent to deliver their job. And that is exactly what we are doing today with workforce development. And you know, we, we are enabling you know, people to do that. Then we evaluate all our activities to see whether this is in line with uh, the current practices, you know. And so, so this continues like that. And the focal point is the research. We have to continue to do innovative research to find a way to better the life and quality of life of people. So now you may want to ask me, so what is the role of pharmacists in all of this? There are several roles of pharmacists in, within you know, public health. Traditionally, when we think about pharmacists' role, we think about reading the prescription, dispensing, and we have moved forward from that. So this is 21st century, and pharmacists have a role to play in public health. And one of the roles that I believe we can play is to help her monitor the health status of the community. And the pharmacists can come together to mobilize community partners. The pharmacists can mobilize the nurses, the medical doctors, and other healthcare professionals to come together so to solve public health problems. I also believe that pharmacists can empower the community you know, through education, screening, and dissemination of information. During this COVID, I believe that pharmacists can be at the forefront telling people to go and do the screening, telling people the importance of the screening, referring people to the hospital, and asking people to take certain medications. I believe that pharmacists can also engage in policy development. They can help us set rules and regulations around drugs and other things like that. I also believe that pharmacy can be involved in the evaluation process, you know, that assures effective medication utilization. You know, above all, I believe that pharmacies, you know, can be involved in population analysis of medication use and trend. So this way, Pharmacists are part of public health. And I, I, I want to welcome you 
to you know continue to do work in public health. I know you are doing it already. So um, you can stop me. You can raise your hand if you want to ask question. But if not, then I move on. Now uh, let, let's talk a little bit about COVID. So we are in COVID pandemic all over the world right now. And it's not unusual when you go to an intensive care unit, you see a lot, lot of patients. And one of the things that I believe that pharmacists can do is to monitor these patients over time, collect some useful data so that we can have, you know, informed decision for future purposes. I don't know whether you guys are doing it right, right now. Um, in the US, they have a database where every single information about people who, who tested positive and who are hospitalized for COVID are kept. So, and they give us access to those data, although you have to go through some, you know, application. I, so I believe that we can do similar thing in Nigeria maintain a national database, and so we can collect some useful data. So, so today, let, let me, so you, you know, I want to tell you, before we can talk about Kaplamaya, we have to talk about certain rudimentary, okay? Some fundamentals. So when a patient is in the hospital, let's say we hospitalize a patient with maybe COVID-19 or maybe any other illness. We follow that patient until they get better, right? Or until the patient dies. So now, if you look at the picture I put in front of you, so we have a starting period. That is the period that the patient is admitted into the hospital. And we also have a period that the patient is discharged from the hospital, then we call it end of trial. So the, the, we are using this term in the sense of maybe we are doing a study on the patient, okay? But you will agree with me, not all patients who come to the hospital will spend the same amount of time. Some patients will spend longer time as represented by the first patient right here, this line, so is this a long-term patient in the ICU? And you can see there's a, a cycle that is not you know, blocked. That means the patient, when the patient is out of the hospital, we do not know what happened to that patient, okay? So now we have some patient who comes for a very short period of time, like this patient in the middle. Um, and you can see that the patient ends with a cycle with blood cycle. That means that patient experienced the event of interest. And I'm going to talk about the event of interest. Then some patients will come to the hospital for medium you know, time. So we call this follow-up times. That is, we follow patients over time into the future to see what happened to them. Okay? Um, so this is the essence of survivor analysis, the Kaplan-Meier, you know, analysis. So let's let's move on to the next slide. So there are two possible outcomes for a patient who come to the hospital, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's either the patient is alive when they are discharged from the hospital, or they are dead. There are no other outcomes apart from this. No other outcome apart from these two. So what we want to do is, we, we, we want to look at those two functions, alive and death. And we want to express them, you know, in mathematical form. And you will agree with me that death is related to, death is related to life, okay? So, if the rate of death increases, the rate of living decreases. If the rate of being alive increases, the rate of death decreases. Is that not true? So if you look at this, the first thing I want to introduce all of you to 
is called a survival function. And the survival function is saying that, okay, if we choose a specific time, let's say we have, you know, 10 patients in the, in the hospital right now, they are hospitalized, and we say, okay, in the next five days, we want to check how many patients make it up to that five days. So that's what the survival function is saying, that the probability of a patient being alive at that particular, you know, fifth day that we said we are looking at. So if you look at it, the, all patients are alive when they bring them to the hospital. So the survival function when they bring them to the hospital is one. Everybody is alive. Then later on, as time progresses, some patients will die, some patients will still be alive. So we have the curve, you know, the mathematic, theoretical mathematical function to be like this. You can see like inverted X. But if we take our time to infinity, almost everybody is gonna die anyway. So then the, the, the you know, survivor becomes zero at infinity. So I believe everybody understand this, this function. So let's look at the, the death. So the second part is called the death rate or what we call the hazard function. So there are two of them. The first one is what we call the lambda T. See, this symbol is lambda. It's a Greek you know, symbol for lambda. But in biostatistics, we use it to denote you know, uh, the death, the mortality, okay? And that is the proportion of people who, you know, uh, who die divided by the total number of people who are still alive, okay? But there's an, you know, interesting uh, function, um, just like when, when we are driving our car and we want to check, you know, the speed at which we are going at a particular point. We also can check the instantaneous death, that is, the force of mortality, the rate at which people die. So we, we, that's why we come to this integration. I don't want you to, I don't want to bug you too much. So you, we can see when we integrate the force of mortality, we come up with the negative log of survival function. So that means the force of mortality depends on how people survive, okay? Good. So now, if you, if you plot in the rate of death, you know, on, you know, the asset function uh, chart, there are three possible things. The rate of death might be constant and later on increased. So if you look at COVID right now, initially when COVID just came, the rate of death was so high, just like the, this last one, was so high, but right now, the rate of death is going down all over the world. Another scenario might be the rate of death is constant and going on, I and mean, going down later on. Those are the three scenarios that we can find anytime we have a disease or any conditions within uh, the community. So, so what is the rationale for now using the Kaplamaya. So now when we, like, like I said, when we are following people over time, there is tendency for us to lose people that we don't know what really happened to them. So let's say we are following 10, you know, our patient right now, and we don't know what happened to maybe two of them. So in survival, you know, term, we say that they are censored. Okay, they are censored because we don't know what happened to them. And those we know what happened to them, then we say, okay, we observe the event in them. But there's a problem with computing statistical analysis around this type of data. Because when the data is not complete, so what happened is you cannot assume any distribution. Like, okay, do they follow normal distribution? Gauss, Weibull, and other exponential, something like that. So we need a special technique to deal with incomplete data, okay? And this is when Edward Kaplan and Paul Meyer came together. To be honest, they developed the technique you know, separately. And they later collaborated through to develop that disease, I mean, the, the technique more. 
And so they published their you know, research in 1958. And ever since that time, uh, a lot of people have, have contributed to that technique and is used mostly in survival analysis today. So the Kaplamaya techniques, as we know it right now, is the type of techniques that we use to deal with the incomplete observation when we follow up you know, patient or study participant over time. That's why we call it Kaplamaya. You know, it's just the name of those who invented the method, okay? And, uh, and I'm gonna show you um, some examples so you can understand exactly what I'm talking about because without example, it may be very difficult to comprehend. So let's believe that these are hypothetical uh, patients that we follow in the hospital. So maybe these people are admitted to, you know, University of Illinois uh, teaching hospital complex, maybe the ICU over there. So there are 12 of them, as you can see. But the 12, 12 of them are partitioned into two groups. Maybe the first group, they are using certain medication that we believe is working better. Um, some people say hydroxychloroquine is better, you know, our president said that. Um, some people said no. Let's say you, you are a pharmacist and you, you want to test that. So when the patient comes to the hospital, then you just put, you know, some group on hydroxychloroquine, maybe that's group one. Then the group two, you put them on something else. Okay, so now you now observe the time that they live within the ICU before they die or, you know, before they are discharged from the hospital. So this individual number B, the patient number B, spent one month in the ICU and at the end of that one month, he died, he passed away and he was on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. So this individual E spent two months. At the end of the two months, he died. He was also on hydroxychloroquine. And this, you know, the individual F spent three months. Uh, at the end of three months, he passed away. And he was also, you know, using hydroxychloroquine. Then the same thing for individual A. The individual A uh, spent four months and, you know, at the end of the four months, passed away and it was also using hydroxychloroquine. So the same thing for individual number D and, you know, spent about four and a half months, passed away. But you can see that individual number C spent five months, but was censored. We did not observe the, uh, the event of interest. The event of interest is death. So this individual was still alive when he, you know, he was out of the hospital and he was taking hydroxychloroquine. So the same thing you know, for those who are not on hydroxychloroquine, anytime you see one, that's death. Anytime you see zero, that is being alive. Okay. So now, how can we you know, uh, compute the Kaplamaya if we have data like this? So what we do, if we have data like this is, uh, let me go back. So this is the data. Uh, so we set up our Kaplamaya like this. So this is Kaplamaya for group one. So what happened is we have a column called the type of event. That is the time of death. If you go back to that slide, you will see that the time that we observe death in group one was one month, two months, three months, four months, and four and a half months. We do not observe death at five months. The fifth month, we don't know what happened to that patient. The patient was not in the hospital again. Whether he or she is alive, we don't know. So we do not include the time that, you know, the event did not happen. So, and each of these times, the event happened, only one person died, okay? And if you look at the total number of people at month number one, there are six of them and only one person died. So the proportion of death is one divided by six, which is 0 0.167. So 
So, so the probability of being alive at that particular time or the proportion of people who are still alive will be one, you know, minus this, that is 0 0.833. So the probability of being alive at one month among those patients is 0 0.833. Um, let me see whether I can use, you know, um, the pen. Okay, the red pen. Okay, so now look at the second month. So we observe one event. Remember at the second month, one person already died. So there are only five people left in the study. So one over five, and that is 0 0.2. So if you look at the proportion, you know, alive at that particular time, that would be one minus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8. So the probability of making it up to two months is now the product of this and this one. And the product of the two is this, is 0 .0, 0 0.667. So the same thing we go to, you know, the, in the, the third month. And so you have the, the probability of death as zero, I mean, the probability of being alive as 0 0.75. So you also multiply this, this, and this, you get 0 0.5, and that's how we do. So this is the, uh, all, everything that we have here is called the cumulative probability of survivor in Kaplamaya, okay? So we do similar thing for uh, group two. Um, I'm looking at my time here. Um, so then we come up with also the cumulative um, survivor uh, for group two. So what we do now is we now plot those cumulative probability in what we call the Kaplamaya curve. So if you look at the group one, so you will see that at the beginning of the study, everybody is alive, you know, in, in, in the study. Everybody that comes to the hospital, they didn't bring, bring the dead body to the hospital. People are alive when they come. So, but you can see that group one, at least the, anytime you see this step, that is when somebody, you know, died. So at one month, somebody died. At, you know, two months, somebody died like that, like that. As you can see, then, you know, at the fifth month, we don't know what happened to the last patient. So we stop there. So the same thing we did for, you know, uh, group two. We, so now the, the question now comes, how do we compare the survivor experience of these two groups? What statistical technique can we use to compare their experience? How can we say hydroxychloroquine is better or worse for these, you know, uh, people, okay? So now, what we do is, there are two things that we can do. Number one, we can look at a time when, you know, 50% of the people are still surviving. We call it median survival time. And if you look at median survival time right here, for the first group, you will see that almost 50%, I mean, the second group, almost 50% of the group, they already passed away by the first month. And the second, you know, group, that is group one, 50% of their patients were still alive by the third month. Obviously, in this particular case scenario, maybe aggressive chloroquine is working because group one, experience, you know, better survivor experience than the group two. So, but that doesn't tell, you know, everything about what is going on. Remember, every single patient who comes to the hospital, they are different in age. Some people have different comorbidities. Some people, you know, they are younger. Some people are older. You know, some people have frail health. They have other health conditions. So it is unfair to not compare the two groups if we do not take those conditions into consideration. I hope everybody is following my story. So that takes us to what we call 
you know, a statistical test that we call log, log ranked, you know, test, which is based on a chi-square, which I believe every one of you, you are familiar with chi-square, the observed minus the expected, you know, square divided by the expected. So, and we form what we call the hypothesis, the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the survivor in group one is not different from that survivor in group two. Or we can have the alternative hypothesis that the survivor in group one is different from the survivor in group two. So if we find you know, a p-value and our p-value is less than 0 0.05, which is the conventional um, benchmark that we normally use, we will say that, okay, we reject this null hypothesis and we observe that the alternative hypothesis that is the survivor you know, experience in group one is very different from the experience in group two. Okay, so now, um, like I was saying, there are different variables or different scenarios that a patient brought to the hospital. Some people are older, some people are younger, some people have pre-existing condition, some people are, you know, um, maybe in Nigeria, everybody is black. In the United States, some people are black, some people are white, and, you know, um, some people probably have other conditions that differentiate them from other people. So what we can do to, you know, model that is, so this is, okay, when they finish, do they die or not? Are they, you know, do they die or do they, are they still alive? So then we, we use what we call a Cox proportional hazard model that looks at the baseline hazard and all those variables, maybe age, gender, uh, maybe the type of socioeconomic status that they have. And we now plot you know, uh, that regression model. So when we plot the regression model, uh, we come up with what we call hazard ratio. So you can compare two people, you know, different age, you can compare different, you know, gender. And when the hazard ratio is less than maybe, um, I think somebody is telling me that, oh, I will send the presentation um, to uh, the organizer um, so you can get it. So thank you. So now, we, we come up with HR when HR is less than one. So the variable that we are looking at, that means the variable is favorable, you know, uh, to the condition we are looking at. If it's greater than one, it's very, very hazardous. Okay, so let, let's move on to, I'm, I'm aware of time. Please give me, you know, some time. So let, let's go to the, so, so those are everything about Kaplamaya. Now that I believe everybody is, uh, you know, expert in Kaplamaya right now, <laughs> so we can now go to the actual study where the Kaplamaya is used. So here they use the Kaplamaya techniques that, that, that I just talked about. They use it, you know, to examine the severe COVID-19 patient who had diabetes, you know, in the hospital. And this particular study took place in China. So the investigators were trying to look at the clinical characteristics of patients with severe COVID-19, you know, and, and they, they also present with diabetes mellitus. That is, before the patient comes to the hospital, they already have diabetes. And they now have COVID. And because they have COVID, their condition is so severe. And I, I can read your mind. Uh, that what is the connection between COVID and diabetes? Remember <clears throat> that the COVID is airborne and they go straight to the lung. Uh, they start the inflammation you know, process in the lung. The inflammation causes the blood to clog and the individual patient cannot uh, breathe very well. Remember, that's exactly what diabetes does. The diabetes also increases certain chemical mediators inflammatory chemical mediators like, you know, tumor necrosis factor and interleukin. These are glycoproteins in the body that the body produces 
to you know um, cause inflammation. And the reason why there's inflammation in the body is, you know, the body wants to repair the damage, you know, cells. That's why they release those chemicals. And also, diabetes have been shown to decrease the FEV, that is the vast, you know, expiratory volume and the vast, you know, uh, vital, you know, capacity. Okay, so now, so what they do is they included any patient who is older, who is greater than 18 years of age, and whom they can find a laboratory confirmation, you know, of, you know, PCR that they have COVID. And they also look at their chest, you know, CT findings, you know, and the standard diagnosis confirmed that they have COVID. That's the, those people are included. And they also collect some data variable like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular and cerebral, you know, vascular diseases, chronic kidney and pulmonary diseases. Then they look at the age, gender, and some clinical, you know, symptoms like fever, the cough, dyspnea, uh, pectoralgia, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, anorexia, and some lab, lab data like CR, you know, CRP, uh, coagulation factor, random blood glucose, all sorts of things like that. So, now they define their diabetes, you know, as somebody who says that okay, they have this reported history of diabetes, um, or maybe they are on you know diabetes medication, uh, or maybe you perform you know uh, fasting plasma glucose or random plasma glucose, or there's a sign of hyperglycemia, which I believe everybody knows when a patient is you know having you know blood vision, they are having constant headache frequent urination, you know, they are thirsty all the time. You, that's, that's, those are signs of hyperglycemia. And so if you dictate that in the hospital, so you know that this particular patient is diabetic. I'm aware about time, please. Uh, please give me some time. So uh, according to the study, there were 193 patients, okay, uh, within their study, 48 of which um, had diabetes and 145 patients without, you know, diabetes. So um, they look at the level of severity, you know, and these are the criteria that they use. I'm not going to go through, you know, how they classify the severity, but just for you to know that, you know, anybody who falls within the criteria, the respiratory is greater than 30 breaths per minute. Uh, the oxygen saturation is less than 93%, you know, the PO2 and FO2 less, you know, uh, than about 300, you know, mm of mercury. Those are the patients they classify as being severe. So they use, you know, the Kaplamaya, you know, estimation techniques to generate the survival curves. And they also use the long run test to determine the association between, you know, certain variables. Guess what? So among the patients with severe COVID-19 with diabetes, more people who died were men. About 76% were men or 70, you know, seven, uh, compared to 23, you know, uh, without, you know, um, non-severe cases. So the non-survivor, that is those who died, they had severe inflammatory response and cardiac, you know, cardiac, hepatic, and renal coagulation impairment. And we will see later on the Kaplamaya table, when they draw their Kaplamaya table, you will see that the non-diabetic, you know, patient, you know, who have COVID, compared to the diabetic patient who have COVID, you see that non-diabetic patient, they have better survival experience than the diabetic patient. And you can see at the beginning, it's like the experience is the same at the beginning of the study. But as time goes on, those without diabetes, they, they survive better than those with diabetes. And you can see when they, you know, um, look at whether these two curves are the same using the log right test, you can see the log right test is less than 0 0.01. You know, that means we reject the hypothesis that they are the same. We say that, okay, 
the diabetes, the people without diabetes, they actually survive better than people uh, with diabetes. So they also use Cox proportional hazard model to look at, they look at diabetes as the main, you know, variable comparing, you know, uh, two patients, you know. And so if you have diabetes, that patient is more likely to die three times more than the patient who does not have the diabetes. That's the meaning of that. I can see that my time is up. <laughs> so the conclusion is that the mortality rates in patients with severe COVID-19 uh, with diabetes is considerable. And so diabetes may lead to an increased risk of death. So I believe that we can do similar thing in our hospitals in Nigeria. We can apply the you know, Kaplamaya procedure to look at certain variables among our patients who are admitted into the hospital. And you can do this retrospectively, or you can do it prospectively. That is, you can start sometime, maybe uh, next month, follow patients over time, or you can look at the medical charts of patients in the past and look at it. So um, I'll be interested in joining hands with you, collaborating with you uh, to, to do something like that. I, I can see, oh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, so that's, that's what I have. I don't know whether we have a few minutes. I can you know, introduce you to a software that we call it R, R for Richard. The software is free for everybody. And you can install that software on your laptop or your desk you know, top in the office. And you can play around with the data, and I can show you, you know, uh, certain data. So the, I will, I will defer to the moderator if I have a few minutes yes, to demonstrate. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, okay. Five minutes. Oh, th thank you. So thank you so much. I'll demonstrate that. So let, let's go. Um, let me get out of uh, this screen. And let me go to my desktop. And I will share the R. Okay, so there's R right now on my desktop. So I will continue sharing the screen. So here's the screen, share. And this is exactly, um, I hope you guys are looking at my screen. Okay, so this is exactly uh, R. This is how R would look like. In You know, it doesn't look very fancy but it's very powerful. So there, there's already, you know, a data called ovarian that I will share with you. But just like a mechanic or even, you know, somebody who wants to, a building construction, if you want to construct a building, there are certain instruments that you use. So in R, there are certain packages that you will need for each of these statistical techniques. So for this one, um, I don't know whether you can see this very well. We, we will need, you know, something called survivor, you know, survivor uh, package to help us to do the statistical analysis, you know. So now, uh, and I want to use the data called ovarian, you know, data. And the ovarian data is the, you know, uh, uh, people who have ovarian cancer you know, in the hospital and they follow them over time. Uh, how do I want to check this data? I can check the data by saying, uh, fix my ovarian. Fix means, you know, check the data. As you can see the data right here. Um, so the first, you know, is the follow up time, F U time. The second is, you know, the follow up status. One means, you know, death. Zero means, you know, um, censored, and the age of the patient, the residual of the disease, whether the, you know, ovarian cancer shrink or is still increasing, the treatment group, and the echo, whether the patient is better or not. Okay, so I think I'm getting, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, my Ife guys. So, 
Now, let me close this data. Now that we know the data, then we can fix, you know, the Kaplamaya, you know, table. So we will say that I can say, you know, I can call it fit one uh, is equal to us so then we write the follow up that f u time uh, comma f u start and I come like that. Oh, sorry, he said he didn't find my you know my variables. I forgot to attach it. Attach ovarian. So this is not you know uncommon. So now you find it. So summary of uh, one. So you you can see you know um, you you can see you know it doesn't tell you anything right now. But what I can do is I can apply the Kaplamaya <clears throat> by using the suffix. And what I would do using the suffix is I would say uh, maybe fit two. Oh, oh, sorry, fit two. Is that two or Z? Okay. So is equal to uh, soft fit uh, soft. Then we have uh, every time F starts, then we want to look at it in terms of the treatments. Uh, treatments. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sorry, folks. Um, I'm I'm trying to. Oh shoot. <laughs> Rx. I forgot to put the you know treatment group. Ooh, ooh. Oh, if you start. So this is not uncommon in um, in 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 if you start. In when you are plug, plug, plotting, you know, uh, the Kaplamaya. So summary fits two. So now, if you look at it, so just like I showed you in during the presentation, there are two groups: those in treatment one, those in treatment two, and we have the Kaplamaya table right there, you know. And this doesn't tell you much. We can fit the Kaplamaya, you know, test. We can say, um, I want to fit the Kaplamaya. I can say plot, you know, and fit two. Okay. And if I do that, see, that's my Kaplamaya. But this is this didn't tell you much because you don't know which group it is. So I can go back. I can say, okay. I can add color. I can say color, uh, maybe group one is red. Group one is red and the group two is blue. Okay, and when I enter like that, okay, see color. Okay. Red, the first group red, the second group uh, blue. Then I can clear this one. And I'll be, I'll be willing, uh, I'll be willing to uh, go, because of our time, I'll be willing to uh, go through this training of the software, you know, uh, for people for whatever reason um, is is not, you know, uh, cooperating, you know, probably because I'm presenting this, you know, art to you for the first time. So 
let, let me stop there and ask you. As you can see, the, for, the first group experienced the better survivor than the second group. So that's the function that we use in, in, in R. So I want to get out of there and stop sharing so I can ask if you have any question for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Anamu. Thank we you. It's a um, very ex explicit presentation. Thank you. Where the software, it? by the way. Sorry? Oh, somebody was asking you know, whether the software is free. The software is free and I can get you know, uh, the information on how to download the software to the organizer mm -hmm. so they can distribute it to you. We oh, appreciate that. Yes. During your presentation, you highlighted um, public health services that are essential and the role of public health pharmacists or pharmacists in these public health services. Yes. We went straight into the Kapla Mayor's uh, tool, the usefulness to help us um, identify a treatment option that is superior to the other, which can be done both prospectively or retrospectively. Really right. appreciate it. We will now welcome questions from the participants. So far, the request has been on the PowerPoint presentation, the software. If we have individuals that want to make comments, they can indicate that with a show of hand. So, um, so if anybody wants, you know, collaboration with my university uh, or with the group of uh, people here, I'll be willing to connect you with my colleagues. We have so many people with different expertise um, that we can do. I think one of the things that is lacking with us back home is we, we have all the data. We have everything. All we just need to do is to make an informed decision based on the data that we have. We don't need to wait for from anybody from abroad, you know. Um, so I believe that we can work together and I really want to commend Dr. Bello, you know, Dr. Wheeler, and all of you, uh, the dean uh, for the HOD for you know, thinking about this type of forum. I think this is very great. Reaching out to people, sharing knowledge. Um, I, I enjoyed you know, my friend's presentation about two weeks ago, Dr. Adebayo. And you know, yes, you can use Kaplamaya for any event apart from death. They just call it survivor analysis. You, you can use it for, you know, let's say time to get insurance. You know, if people do not, are not insured, you can compare insured people to uninsured people. You can, you know, you can look at mental, uh, severe mental episode. If somebody is coming, you know, with episodes of mental illness, you can look at um, maybe remissions in cancer, you know, when you put you know, patients on cancer medication and they go into remission, that is, they, 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 there is temporary relief. And when they go out of remission, so you can use it for so many scenarios like that. That's the response to the question that has been posted here that can Kaplamea score be used to evaluate outcomes other than death? Yes, it can be used. Yes. Can we have more questions? Another question is, can it be used for more than one drug? That, that is very correct. You can have three groups. You can have a combination of drugs. You know, you can have two groups with combination of drugs. So you evaluate, you know, the effectiveness of those combinations. Or you can have more than two groups with different types of medication. So, you know, there are different scenarios. Uh, and, you know, I will talk with the organizer later on to see whether we can have time for only software use mm -hmm. and, you know, different examples. If that is possible, then we can do that. That'd be great. Yes. There's another question. 
What does the number at risk mean? And how can it be interpreted? So, so the, the number at risk, so when you are following people over time, so that means the remaining people in your study, they're at risk of being alive or being at death. So is the probability of being alive is a risk because they still have the severe COVID-19. So that put them at risk of death. So risk means the probability of getting something. Um, I saw my colleague right here, Dr. Stephen Grant, uh, posted you know, any kind of outcomes uh, analysis. Of course, you can do outcome analysis you know, with, you know, with Kaplamaya too. Um, it's, it's a very robust you know, uh, program. Um, so for example, uh, when, you are, when you want to look at you know, the healthcare system within a system, whether it's better than before. So in the United States, there's something we call Obamacare. And people are now doing outcome analysis. They want to see whether the reform that the you know, former president did you know, to the healthcare system in the United States is better than before. So those are come outcome research. Yes. Yes, there's another question here. Very is where does statistic and data analytics meet as regards emerging roles of pharmacy, for pharmacists? I, I believe that, you know, pharmacists have a role with data analytics, you know, uh, for those people who probably don't know the data analytics that we, we're talking about, you know, looking at the trend when you have, you know, large data and you can monitor the real-time trend with data analytics. And I believe that pharmacists have, because the pharmacists, to me, are the custodian of drug, they have the deeper understanding of medication. So therefore, we should be the one talking about medication. I don't believe that we should use, we should leave other professionals to help us talk about our own medication. That's our profession, you know? So therefore, I believe that the pharmacy is supposed to come into the field. I would challenge everybody here today. If you want to become a public health, you know, experts, you know, uh, public health informatics and, you know, analytics, uh, you know, data analysts, please contact me. We need to join hands together so that we can do something, okay? Yeah, yeah you, you, so okay. the... Okay. There's another question for you. So how can one determine number of deaths in retrospective studies, judging from the fact that these patients have been discharged? Oh, that, that very good question, you know, uh, Dr. Orak. Um, so in retrospective study, what you do is you go back to the data and you follow the, you know, the patient from the day one, they enter the hospital. So you reconstruct the experience as if that time you are at that particular point. And you follow that patient over the time. Let's say this is 2020 and somebody wants to look at the data in the last six, uh, maybe last year. So you went back maybe to November up to maybe March this year, and you reconstruct that experience and you follow the patient over time to see when do they die, you know? Oh, this patient came in in September, they died in January, they came in, you know, uh, in November, they died in February. Those are retrospective. It is true, it has happened, but you follow them, you know, retrospectively, you reconstruct the experience, you know, um, that, that's why we call it retrospective, you know, a study. See one more question for you. Say to use Kapla Meyer, do you, do you not have to make adjustments for confounding factors for the study group? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And that's exactly what Cox's proportional hazard model is doing. So you can look at other variables, important variables like age and things that can confound your results. And you can adjust it within the Cox you know, uh, proportion. It is because of time that I, you know, I'm not able to show you how to actually fit the Cox you know, proportional uh, model. 
But you know, we can do that later on if people are interested. Um, and I also saw that some people are asking for my contact information. Um, my, I, I can show the contact information very briefly. People can write it down or I can send it, you know, directly, um, you know, to the organizer to distribute. So. Can you show it so that we can write it down? Because, can, can, can you share it so that we can write it down? Oh, I can share it right now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So that's, that's fine then. I uh, will share it. Uh, okay. So. By the way, these are references. So that, that's my contact information, uh, my name, uh, my title at Nova, you know, Southeastern University, uh, Dr. Kiran Patel College of Osteopathy. Public Medicine, Department of Public Health. I'm in HPB building, room 1593, uh, Fort Lauderdale. And you know, this this is my office telephone. If you call that office telephone, it comes to my phone directly. Then my email address is J A L A M U number one at nova.edu at nova.ed. See, one more question. See, how okay. can you the two to a drug utilization study? How can I? Relate the two, Kaplameyer's two, to a drug utilization study. OK. Yeah, I, I think I saw that question. How can you relate you know, the two uh, to drug utilization? We can actually look at drug ut utilization study in, in different ways, depending on our interest. You know, um, for, so for example, um, my president, thank you so much. Uh, so for example, when you look at, in, in this country, in United States, when you look at the most used drug is lisinopril. Everybody knows that in the country. And you know the work of lisinopril anyway. And you know, there are so many different levels of drug ut utilization, but we can use a Kaplamaya study <clears throat> or even some other aspect of survival analysis to see a trend in drug utilization within a community. One of the questions I do ask people is, you can actually determine the public health issues of a community through the drug utilization. You can say, oh, in e-learning, for example, wow, people are using a lot of maybe uh, um, uh, Sabuta law, or, you know, um, maybe asthma drug. And you keep on wondering, why are people getting more asthma drug from the hospital? That's probably because more people are getting asthma within the population. Or maybe people are, on met for me or other things like that, you begin to suspect that maybe uh, diabetes is becoming common within the community. So drug utilization is a very good tool to diagnose the community problem. And we can use Kaplamaya and survivor tools for that. We want to thank so, everybody. And you know, uh, for, if, I, I just want to say thank you everybody um these are my little crew uh myself and victoria and jonathan you know they make my life so you know worthwhile living and so i i really want to thank everybody if there are more questions i can answer your question and um, i really want to thank the people who attend the presentation today um Uh, and, and I believe that we can we can do it. Okay, we can do it. Um, yes, the Dr. Ibrahim. Yeah, I think I remember your face. <laughs> so nice meeting you. Yeah, we want to thank everybody for participating. I want to personally recognize some professors here, Professor Bani Majara from uh, ABU. Professor Riagba from Lagos, Professor Michael Fakumogbo from New Learning, and a host of others. 
We really appreciate you. To give the vote of thanks, we want to call on pharmacists to see for because see for you have our attention, please. Thank you very much, Ma. Good morning, all. I am pharmacist to see for. I'm from the pharmacy department, University of Illinois Teaching Hospital. And on behalf of the pharmacy department, I want to specially thank our guest speaker, Dr. Josiah Alamu. Thank you for the wonderful detailed presentation. We are really, really grateful. It was very informative. We thank you for taking our time to be here with us today. We are really grateful. I will not forget to also thank uh, the HOD, the pharmacy department at the University of Illinois Teaching Hospital, all our deputy directors, participants also from Nova Southeastern University, United States. Thank you for being here with us. Pharmacists in diaspora, we recognize you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. I want to thank uh, the physicians present here and nurses, other healthcare professionals that are tuned in, our distinguished pharmacists from different areas of practice. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope to see you again in our next webinar. I will not forget to thank, very much thank uh, Dr. Bello. He has worked tirelessly to put this all together. So thanks to everyone here present. God bless you. We hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are making us proud as a pharmacist. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you, especially in public health. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah. So on this note, I want to say bye to everyone. And the next week that goes, it's going to be another time. Prof. See you some other time. Thank yeah, you. thank thank you. Mm, thank bye bye. We appreciate. It. So the the slide, please don't forget to send it to us. Oh yes, I will. I will send it to you. Uh, can you please forward your email address to me? Oh, we do. Yeah, I I will send it to you immediately. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. My regards to everybody in NSU. Okay. The and forgot members. Yeah. Right. Bye.